Um, we're going to talk um, throughout these two days about China and Europe um, uh, and how they see each other, how they perceive each other. Um, and we'll, we will try and sort of look at um, different ways of producing images of each other, of understanding these images of each other. And what I will try to sort of give an interlude to this today is to show you that there are actually different ways of looking at each other. Um, and sort of these different ways of looking at each other um, are actually why um, we have mutual misunderstandings, perhaps. Um, so since the end of the 19th century, these way, ways of looking at each other may be intensified by use of certain technological um, uh, uh, methods, um, such as the binocular with which you can see well. Um, and the, I, my point of view, my, my basically point of argument will be that looking at Germany or at Europe from China led to something um, all the way to Xi Jinping's um, Chinese Renaissance or his Chinese dream. And on the other hand, um, looking from Europe to China has led in uh, the early 21st century or late 20th century to something we could call a new yellow peril. Now it's all about looking. Um, and it's all about looking in different ways. Now when China was looking at Europe very intensely at the end of the 19th, early beginning of the um, 20th century, and they knew that when Europe was looking at China, they were thinking about China in this way. They thought it was a sleeping dragon, one that uh, would perhaps eventually evade, and that would be very, very dangerous. Now, the Chinese started thinking about this, and they re realized, and this um, is read, of course, from, red, uh, from, from right to left and from top to bottom, right, which is very important. So earlier, China was this huge tiger, very, very scary, um, and everybody was running away from it, especially the foreigners, uh, whereas eventually, you now, um, now we are on the left-hand side, um, the foreigners are basically debunking um, that dragon, not dragon, uh, that lion or tiger or whatever, um, that, that animal that is so um, dangerous, and, and they are actually taking it apart, which is kind of ironic if you think, and I'm sure that this image is part of that cultural memory that plays into uh, Mao Zedong's thought um, and, and also words about the paper tigers that he wanted um, to attack. Anyway, <clears throat> so there is this discourse very early on already in the 19th century, China must wake up. Interestingly, this China Pak um, is read the other way around, so it's read in the European way. And also, you know, the China um, Pak reader is dressed in a European way, so they already internalize ways of looking from Europe to China, and uh, by looking back at how Europe is doing it, they are transforming themselves, they are waking up. And um, this whole discourse of waking up is very, very strong in the early 20th century, so you will have here, you know, um, while the foreigner is looking on and trying trying to basically eat up China, and the um, uh, officials on the right-hand side are always just, you know, um, uh, buckling to the foreigners. Um, the Chinese have to be, the Guomin in the middle, right, have to be woken up by the journalists who tell them, up there is enlightenment, the sun, right, is brightness, come out of your dark and uh, come back to consciousness. This is another um, journal that um, sort of advocates this and you can see what's happening when those journalists are pushing the Chinese to break up, to come back from darkness into the sun. Um, and what you can see on the right hand side is that some citizens have already, some Gormen have already woken up and they are dressed, some of them already, in Western style clothing so they have been looking far west to Europe, and they've been learning their lesson. Um, and this is sort of embodied, learned the lesson, woken up, um, and the dragon, or in this case, the lion, right, is coming back to life in Liang Qichao's Xi uh, Ming Tsong Bao. Um, this is something, a discourse that, of course, then continues and is um, taken up in Red is the East, um, this wonderful song, right, that everybody knows, Dong Fang Hong Tai Yang Sheng. Uh, China has brought forth Mao Zedong, and he, of course, uh, leads, uh, he 
is the savior of China. Um, he says then uh, in 1949, um, uh, not actually um, on Tiananmen, but he says it anyway, that now China has risen up and China has finally, you know, come apart and we can talk to, e to the people of the world again um, uh, on the same level. We have come, um, as he says, uh, at the political consultative conference um, in 1949 in September already. From now on, our nation will belong to the community of the peace-loving, freedom-loving nations of the world, and ours will no longer be a nation subject to insult and humiliation. We have stood up. Um, this is a discourse that comes from looking hard and internalizing what, what I have seen, and it's a discourse that um, is very much determined by the way that the Chinese are looking differently from the way that the foreigners are looking. If you can see here, the foreigners is foreigners actually holding the binocular the wrong way around. So they don't see more, they see less. They don't see bigger, they see smaller. On the other hand, the Chinese don't do it that way. But the reason um, or the, the result of what is happening when the foreigners don't look properly is something that Fritz van der Goltz in Die Gelbe Gefahr im Licht der Geschichte in uh, 1907 writes in one of um, his history books. And he says that basically Europe is completely um, unconscious of what is happening in China, doesn't know anything about um, China. And um, this, of course, um, is, is not good because Europe um, is not realizing what is there. On the other hand, the Chinese, as you can see, holding their binoculars the right way in this um, caricature, and they are seeing hard, and they are seeing a lot. They're learning a lot, and so you have this Chinese Renaissance or Wu Si Yundong, or you know Chinese New Culture Movement, whatever you want to call it, um, where Chen Duqiu says that um, Europe um, has come become so awesome, so brilliant, um, because it has all these revolutions, and we have to make the kinds of revolutions that Europe has made. And what he's actually referring to, and what many um, like him, so for example, Hu Shi, who has been termed the father of the Chinese Renaissance, um, what many of them are saying is China needs a Renaissance. China needs to stand up. China needs to have something um, as, uh, that Europe also had in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. And we really have to redo and remake our country. I want my readers to understand, says Hu Shi in his Haskell lectures that he gives in Chicago um, in the 1930s, um, that cultural changes of tremendous significance have taken place and are taking place in China slowly, quietly, but in unmistakably, the Chinese Renaissance is becoming reality. And it may look, he says, um, very Western, but in fact, it is China coming to a new life here. Why? Because China, for already a couple of decades then, has been looking very hard to Europe and has been learning from the things that Europe has done and has been doing the kinds of things that Europe has done. The language that they are using, these Renaissance scholars, is a, a language of making light where darkness was. Qi Meng, they want to enlighten, right? They want to open up to Qi and Meng is to cover, to hide, right? And this is what they want to do. They want to uncover um, everything from darkness. And that is what it leads to in the end again. You know, the east is red, the sun rising. And the sun is rising, um, as you can see in this still from a film that I'm going to try and um, show you in the background while I'm talking. Um, the sun is rising again, and this is Xi Jinping's The East is Red, right? And Xi Jinping is coming in again. Um, as the savior of China, as the one bringing the Renaissance to China, finally. Um, and he does it with all of these symbols. So it's, of course, the great China of the um, great, um, and he's looking hard. <laughs> he's, it's, oops, I'm missing some elements. So we have to watch the film. It's the great China, um, oops, and ah. Of um, the Great Wall is the Great China of the Great Armies. It's a very, very strong and great China. And who is the big star of people's happiness now? It's Xi Jinping, right? He loves the people, um, and he is the one. He is the new red sun for China. Therefore, he's our guide, right? And, uh, 
of course, he's also responsible for all this Renaissance and technology because he uh, is developing everything um, in this field and he leads us forward. So we must realize the China dream, right? Um, which is his Renaissance, after all, in order to do what he has always wanted um, to do and what China has been wanting to do for 150 years. Now this is, this is, is the third uh, verse, which is about the Chinese uh, Communist Party being so great, and you can see how militaristic this is getting. And this is why I think, and I'm going to stop it now, this is why I think um, we need to look back to China as well. Um, so the Chinese have been looking very, very hard for 150 years. There are lots of images of Europe in China and they've been internalized. And the Chinese have been realizing very early on, this is 1909, that they shouldn't be looking the wrong way. The European, however, haven't. So the Europeans think that the Chinese are just copying that they're just remaking, they're just producing something, but they are not. Um, and this is something, you know, that the asymmetries are now shifting. The big star of people's happiness is not just the big star of the uh, rivers and the mountains and the Great Wall and all of this. It's also the big star of the military. And so his, this whole film ends with the doves going up in the sky and the peaceful rise, of course. But it is a question um, that I think we need to ask ourselves. Is it possible that we can still look the wrong way? Um, China, this dragon, is no longer sleeping. Uh, we do not want a yellow peril discourse um, to be the only discourse that we have about China. We want a discourse that is more informed about China. Uh, we can't any longer um, have China being a Buch mit sieben Siegeln, a book that we don't understand. Uh, we have to start um, and learn Chinese history in the same way as China has been learning European history for many, many years. And so we must know that the dragon isn't sleeping anymore. And even if that Chinese dream uh, is just a remake of the American dream, it might be a better dream to dream, after all, since the American dream has become strange in the days of Trump today. Anyway, this is where I end, and, and I end with the sort of idea that China has been looking for a long time. There are lots and lots of images of Europe in China that have been internalized. When do we start looking from here to China? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>